Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Gen Ed. Uh, we have a very special guest today, Dr. Calvin Sun, who is currently an emergency physician in New York. He is also the CEO and founder of the Mo Monsoon Diaries, if that's correct. Yes, Monsoon Diaries. And it's like a travel uh, blog where, and program where you can actually go and travel with a group of people who usually travel solo. It's super interesting. And so uh, can I call you Calvin? Is that correct? You can call me Calvin. Okay, Calvin. <laughs> so I guess I know you went to Columbia uh, mm -hmm. University, biochemistry, correct? I don't even know what that means, but apparently I was a biochemistry major. <laughs> it's so long, I don't even know what like, biochemistry means. I think something with like construction, biology and chemistry, I was not a great student. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny because that's what um, I'm I'm studying. So yeah, you, you probably know more about it than I do. Well, yeah. <laughs> and and now you're a frontline worker in New York City emergency room battling uh, the whole COVID pandemic right now. So mm -hmm. can you tell me a little bit like uh, your parents are immigrants from China. Um, that's what my Wikipedia stalking told me. Uh, but besides that, um, so could you tell me like your upbringing, what led you to where you are today? Just a little bit of background information before we dive into some other questions. I mean, it's going to be a long story. <laughs> <laughs> the theme is uh, I didn't plan for any of this. There were no plans. I never really had aspirations or dreams or goals because my life uh, when I was growing up never allowed me to uh, inhabit a space where I can make those dreams. I didn't have the privilege of being able to decide what I wanted to do until much later. Uh, and even then I didn't know enough. And uh, in that insecurity, I decided to do what I knew best, which is to commit to the present and have little victories add up uh, without knowing where it would lead me to get to where I am today. And I can say authentically that this is exactly where I'm supposed to be, even though I never planned for it. Uh, it's very ironic for me to think of myself as a doctor and someone who leads travel groups around the world uh, full time while as a full time when I was a full time student uh, in resident training, and now a doctor, um, because I didn't want to be a doctor and I didn't want to travel. <laughs> so I was born and raised in New York City uh, in Manhattan. And it's a city, those of you who haven't heard of it, uh, the whole world comes to New York. There's no need to travel as a born and raised New Yorker brat. Uh, I was a child thinking that, you know, I'll never travel, traveling is stupid. Why spend so much money to go to places I'm never gonna live in anywhere because New York City is the best city in the world. You know, these are all quotes because I, I, I you know, I was very aware at the time how bratty I sounded uh, when I you know, would say those things to myself, but I kind of, I really meant it. like. You know, when people would leave during uh, spring break or winter break, I would stay on campus like Harry Potter and you know, <laughs> just have the whole place to myself exploring, like, you know, the, you know the, the things that I take for granted every day. And that was my travel. I never just never wanted to leave. Of course, I went on like family trips. I had the privilege, you know, I, I recognize the privilege of being born and raised in Manhattan, having family that can travel in the first place. My dad took me on his business trips. But I never really cared for it. Uh, and all I knew growing up was that I was forced to be a doctor. My mom and dad both really wanted me um, to go into medicine without even giving me a choice that other, you know, immigrant families, uh, people, um, families of color, Asian Americans, AAPI, uh, where sometimes they get a choice between medicine, business, finance, law, engineer. I was told I could only be a doctor. And it wasn't until the summer of 2006 in between my sophomore and junior year of college when my dad died of a sudden heart attack. My mom got diagnosed with Parkinson's formally. I mean, she was always struggling with some issues with neurologically. Uh, a few weeks later, because she was just so much on antidepressants ha raising me, um, I guess I was a handful. And uh, my girlfriend broke up with me soon after my father's funeral. Uh, and that happened in all the span of a, a summer day. And I didn't have any money to pay for tuition because my dad was the breadwinner. Uh, my mom was unemployed. Uh, and so um, 
yeah, I was preparing myself to drop out of college. And, you know, I was living in the, uh, in a frat house that summer, uh, because we couldn't pay for you know, the mortgage or, you know, even afford rent. So in that freedom, I decided not to become a doctor. Uh, the best job I had at the time was a bartender. That was my favorite job. And I started to become a bartender in New York City, made, you know, becoming financially independent, working for myself, having total freedom. And to make a long story short, uh, I just started realizing two years after college, I did this like after college, I did this for two years, just like flying by the seat of my pants, not knowing what I'm supposed to be and being okay with that. Uh, realizing that I might be rejecting the possibility of a life calling, like being a doctor because of my dad or because of a stereotype. And if I were to do that for the rest of my life, they win. Uh, I'm now not doing something because of the power of my father. Uh, and I don't want to wake up one day looking back. It's like, I could have been a doctor. Uh, and no, but I said to live a life that was so angry at him that I decided to do something because of him or not do something because of him. He still has that influence over me. If I truly want to think for myself, doctor or no doctor, I need to decide for myself. And uh, in that uh, back and forth, it's kind of like the poison cup scene from The Princess Bride, where you don't know which one is a poison cup. So you just might as well just take one of them because it's in, in action means you're going to die anyway. Um, I decided, you know, I, I didn't know which should I like decide not to do it or should I do it? Uh, because they both seem equally terrible choices and both seemed equally great choices. Um, I wouldn't know unless I did it. If I had decided to become a doctor, then is that me being guilty and giving into my dad, the ghost of my father? And, uh, and I said, long story short, but what happened was I was bartending. I met a girl. I lost a bet to her. 36 hours later, I found myself in Egypt. That was the bet uh, with her. Um, she never quite left my bar. Uh, and I remember being in Egypt. I'm like, who are you? And yeah, and that was my first time out of the country alone, like truly, truly alone. And it took me three weeks uh, in that experience of that experience. I mean, we, we spent a, day, a couple of days together, but like I spent the next three weeks alone uh, in the winter of 2010, where I was by myself, just hating it. I was like, oh, traveling is so stressful. I feel like I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I don't know anyone. Nobody knows me. It took me three weeks kicking and screaming, traveling alone to finally like wake up in a tonic, just going, oh, I get it. This is why people travel. Like three weeks of being forced to do something I hated to come back and say, okay, this is why people travel. It's the first time I'm actually truly alone by myself. Where I can only rely on myself. And I came back just, you know, a little bit, a step closer to becoming my own best friend because I, the only person I was really spending was with myself. And I never had that opportunity in New York city because, or in this, in the, you know, at home for anyone, whether it's social media or physically, you're always constantly bombarded by external stimuli, let alone school, the next assignment, the next test, the next essay. And finally in Egypt, I had three weeks to finally to myself, no internet, nobody, just me. And that's when I decided to apply to medical school, that same kind of bet, where if I don't get in, I can check that box off and have my Oprah story say, I, I, I got rejected everywhere and I can just now become a travel blogger, the next step. Um, <laughs> but that did not happen. One school took that story, loved it. Even when I was insecure about like, or wasn't sure about becoming a, a medical student, but they said like, this is real. Like finally someone that isn't writing an essay like, oh, I love science. I want to help people. I want to, I know I want to be a doctor. You are actually real and you were honest saying like, I'm not sure, but I will consider I'm open to it. And you know, this is a journey. And they took a chance on me, lost, you know, that bet. And, <laughs> and I mean, literally as, as imagine if you're struggling with imposter syndrome, imagine if someone actually told you, you are the imposter. That's what med, that med school told me. He's like, yeah, you're the imposter. You got into the back door. We're taking a chance on you. You seem fascinating. You know, we get some tuition out of it uh, and you get to explore the possibility of being a doctor. I hope you do well. And so the next part of it is I were to get in with my terrible grades and my like below average MCAT scores I took, you know, under duress of my dad was, you know, stressing me out about it. Uh, if I fail out, um, then I know for sure I can check that box off, have my Oprah story, failed every medical school out there uh, <laughs> and I can become a travel blog again. And literally just getting by off the seat of my pants because the, the, I didn't sacrifice anything while I was a med student. I decided to stay bartending, stay in my social justice work, traveled every you know three to four weeks, six weeks at most at a time where I had three days off, I would leave the country um, just to prove that you could do both. Blogging live uh, to show other people that I was doing it or showing people that one was one step away from failing. And after very few close calls of actually failing out, um, because I still am a terrible student, um, but staying true to myself, 
uh, long story short, which is already a long story as it is, here I am. I'm a, I'm a full practicing attending physician in emergency me medicine and assistant professor in emergency medicine. And I run a travel blog still called the Monsoon Diaries, which I haven't stopped updating uh, regularly since 2010 and now have thousands and thousands of people who come on my trips who followed along ever since 2010. That's so amazing. I, in all my internet sleuthing, I did not know that you were like so anti-travel previous to, to you really starting a ton. Like that, that's so crazy to me that you did such an insane 180 flip where not only did you start to enjoy travel and go traveling, but you, it, it became so extreme. Like I've, I don't have to ask anything. Exactly. I, I have a brother who has gone through medical school. He's going into residency, another brother going into medical school to think of them going on. What was it? 46 trips. I think it was, mm -hmm. um, that you did during medical school. Like yeah. it's insane to me. It's, it's <laughs> like medical school is such a massive time commitment. It's already such a, you know, difficult experience, such a notoriously just total grind fest to think that you would not only flip from hating travel to liking travel, but then committing to, to doing one of the hardest academic paths that you can while being one of the most extreme travelers I've ever seen. You're like real life Walter Mitty. Mm -hmm. um, I've cried in is, that movie. <laughs> is, is completely insane to me. What kept you motivated to keep traveling so much? Was it just out of a desire to, to prove that you could and, and also your love of travel? Or what was it that, that kept you going through medical school doing these trips? I think the way you do one thing in life is the way you do everything in life. Uh, I, you can project a lot of how I approach travel to how I approach COVID. Uh, it wasn't a, a conscious decision why I would go into work every day despite a pandemic without you know enough PPE. People were you know combating an invisible enemy. I, it was per diem. I could have said no to going to COVID every day, um, but I decided to go to anyway because I just had to. Like I just couldn't explain for it. There was no logical decision. It was like kind of an emotional, you know. Uh, affirmation that I had to. And I think that, that came from and that derived from uh, a habit I formed while traveling during medical school where I, you know, even when I didn't want to travel, I went anyway. Um, and then you can take that and extrapolate to like the way I feel about brushing my teeth or eating vegetables or going to the gym. There are plenty of nights when I come back, it's like, I really don't want to brush my teeth, but I find myself brushing my teeth. You know, sometimes, you know, you're going to the gym. I'm just like, I'm just not in the mood. I just want to sit up, but I'm still, you know, working out or, you know, dancing at the dance studio. It's just like, I'm not feeling it today, but I have to, because it's, just, it's just a part of me. And, you know, it, it, you can infer that this is all extreme responses because uh, you can see from my map. Um, and I was 23 years old. I haven't been to any country by myself. So you can infer I just didn't I enjoy the idea of traveling. But then once I discovered how good it was for me, I had to flip in response to like all the time I felt like I missed out on um, that in top on top of an environment such as medical school. As you said, it was the, one of the most you know arduous uh, medical, uh, sorry, the ar arduous academic experiences that one can endure. Uh, and therefore, because it was so arduous, I had to respond in kind with an equally extreme measure of re calibrating and recharging. So if medical school is extreme in terms of stress and academic burden, I have to recharge with an equally extreme way in order to bounce back. Um, and if I only have a small limit on time, what is the most efficient way of doing that? I mean, I could do hardcore meditation for 36 hours, uh, or I can, you know, go out partying like crazy for 36 hours. I don't think either is practical because I need time to study. Well, what's one thing to do uh, it, that you can study while doing something? I mean, maybe you can study while going to the gym. Some people study while running, listening to podcasts. You know, these are all valuable things. And travel is not the only thing one should do. But for me, it was studying on an airplane. Getting on an airplane, studying on those long haul flights, sleeping on the airplane, where instead of sleeping in a bed, I'll be sleeping on a, a transatlantic flight, landing in Europe, and then reading on the bus or reading while doing, you know, hiring a driver and driving around, having a friend drive when we see things. And then in between sites, you know, I would study and I would just remember things better. I mean, I didn't say I aced all the exams, but it wasn't like I failed out of every class. <laughs> I mean, it, it was just getting by. Um, but I, I do remember, you know, every time I'll come back from a trip, 
I would feel physically tired, but mentally just on, just like ready to get back in it. And you have to consider that you will never be as young as you are today. You'll never be as young as you are yesterday. This is the time to do those physically extraneous WTF, you know, live by the seat of your pants, dare to dream, dare to live kind of experience, because you're never going to get another chance at this physically. Uh, mentally, though, it was a tonic. Because as physically tired as I was, after every trip, no matter if it was a 24 hour bender in Ireland, New York to Ireland for 25 hours and back in New York within 24 to 36 hours with seven people leading a trip, I was so happy. I was more than happy to get back and study uh, or get into the, the clinicals or you know work a shift in residency um, where you know I wouldn't have gotten that if I spent the last 24, 36 hours off doing my laundry or catching up with friends over boozy brunch. Like those are valuable things. Don't get me wrong, but you know, to do it, all of that, you know, all, all your weeks, spend all your weekends doing boozy brunch or, you know, doing your laundry. Like, you know, once you do a trip like that, going to Ireland for 24 hours, you, now you can understand what you can accomplish in 24 hours. I've been to Ireland in the last 24 hours and now I'm here. Fuck yeah. I can totally now study this entire chapter book, you know, without feeling like I missed out on anything or being distracted. Yeah. So in order to like maintain your mental sanity, you gambled typically pretty much. You took a risk and you decided to travel and I guess you defeated the stereotypical odds that we have, especially with like your whole life story leading up to this. Now looking back, like you can see everything you defeated and accomplished and here you are and you're still putting yourself Fourth, and your plan on traveling in the future. Is there any place you haven't been to that you're dying to go to currently? I haven't been. It's on the list. So all of them, all 49 countries, I think, I, or ter ter territories, I think I have left. Um, so that's mostly Central, Western uh, Africa, the Polynesian Islands, um, Kaliningrad, uh, Cyprus. Bhutan and um, some parts of the Middle East and some Caribbean islands. And then obviously the really, really hard to reach places that are, you require special permissions like, you know, French Shetland, you know, St. Helena, Ascension Island. Plus, if I haven't been, I want to go. And there are a lot of places I want to go back to. Uh, I do. I feel like everything needs to be visited or done twice. Um, I'm not as hell bent as, you know, I want to see visit every country in the world. I don't need to visit every country twice. But I do feel like some places deserve a second look um, because maybe I was in the right place. Um, but I do feel like, you know, it's not like a checkbox thing where I have to see everything. And now I'm a little more just, just letting it come as it may. Um, just knowing that I have to maintain the habit of constantly traveling um, because it's like brushing your teeth. If I stop, um, it's like sharks stopping that, that stop swimming or whales that stop swimming. You just sink. Um, it's the only way I know how. Even as like exasperated as I feel when I'm sitting on a flight, like, oh, another trip. Like there are many times where I'm just like, I wish I could just be in my bed and wake up and just have an easy life tomorrow morning in a cafe, you know, just you know, people watching. But no matter how exasperated I feel in the moment before a trip, I always feel so thankful and grateful when I finish a trip coming back. I'm like, I'm so glad I did that. And now after a pandemic where we were locked down for a year, which I haven't led a month, you know, a proper international monsoon for a whole year. Um, I'm glad I had all those experiences behind me rather than imagine if I had decided to postpone my life. Oh, I'll travel after residency. Oh, I'll travel after my first job. I'll travel after, you know, my first, you know, raise or when I get promoted. Then the you know, pandemics will hit and lockdowns will happen and you'll never get to travel. And then you'll be, you have a family and kids and then you, you'll never really travel. And then it's too old to do it all over again. And then, you know, or at all. And, you know, it's, it's, you don't want to lie on your deathbed when God or whatever energy you believe in says, did you really make the most of it? And you go, no, not really. <laughs> you don't want to be like that person. So somewhat connected to that. I, I want to get into, into your experience with the pandemic in a minute here. I think that's really important. But first, I, I've i never traveled really internationally. I entered Canada a couple times when I lived in Michigan, but I don't think that super counts. Um, but I, 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 had some, I had some trips planned before I was going to start college this past year, but then obviously the pandemic put an end to those plans. Um, and now I have with me possibly one of the most qualified travelers in the world, certainly the most qualified traveler I've, I've ever met, 
quick em- emphasis, this man has been to like 150 countries. Like, allow me to use you as my personal travel agent for a moment and yeah. ask if I, I know you've been on so many trips and this must be like an impossible question to answer really. But for someone who hasn't traveled internationally, who's looking for a, like an incredible international adventure, where, which country or which specific place would you recommend me take my first international trip? And what are maybe some tips to keep the cost of that trip down? I mean, I mean, the answer to any of the questions that someone can ask is it depends, you know, what are you looking for? Yeah. What station in life are you in? Are you in transition or you at the crossroads? Do you want to relax? Do you want to just have an adventure? I mean, the, and then my answer to that is no expectations with travel. Like you can find love, you know, when you're least looking for it uh, in the place that doesn't have any hostels or people with the same age as you. Um, but hey, you know, surprises can happen anywhere travel. I mean, tr- travel is like a marriage. The only way to do it wrong is to think you can control it. So it really anywhere technically, but if you really want to like be practical, pre- pre-pandemic, it was... Southeast Asia uh, as a good starting ground for a lot of younger backpackers who, you know, want to travel. Um, It's possible to travel responsibly. Um, Please do not be a beg packer. I will will write you off. Um, (laughs) But it's it's a place where it's very well traveled, lots of resources, very easy to save money, lots of hostels. But now post pandemic, that's where I'm trying to find out right now. Uh, it's tough because you don't want to travel in a country that doesn't have the infrastructure to handle uh, 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 being a hot zone or a super spreader event by you being a traveler. You have to travel ethically and responsibly. So right now we're trying to figure that out. So I can't really say for sure. I think it, right now as a practical answer is to do a road trip across America in an RV, which is what we did last August. Uh, no infections in the group of 19, sorry, 15 strangers that we've met uh, along the last three weeks. Uh, we did an RV from New York to Seattle. You, you stay inside with a COVID double negative group that's tested or quarantined themselves for two weeks before meeting in the RV, stayed inside, do most of the activities, eat all, all of them outdoors uh, so that you never really infect anyone or get infected. And that was like the safest thing to do. You get to see, this country has everything, really. You want deserts, you want glaciers, you want you know nature, you want cities, uh, food. It has every, really everything and lots of hamburgers. <laughs> um, Pacific Coast Highway after we, you know, ditched the RV, uh, all the way down to Southern California, we took the Amtrak back. There was like, a, you know, what, uh, trains that could fit 200 people. There was only 30 of us, uh, all of us with our own private rooms and, you know, the air, the train cycled the air like 25, 30 times an hour. Um, so it's very, very safe. And, and yeah, it's that we did last August and all of us are COVID negative and super safe since and no super spreader event. Um, so that's like a good start. Uh-huh. I will start posting videos about like the, the day-to-day aspects of you know, traveling domestic. But then the other things are uh, Caribbean islands, uh, U.S. Virgin Islands. The rates are zero right now, the last, at least the last two to three weeks. Uh, nobody has died from COVID at least the last month, I think, or even more. Um, you know, COVID really lives in your body for 10 to 14 days before you're no longer infectious. So it's more of a time frame to be safe with places like those. You have to test negative before getting in. Um, and you know, places like Turks and Caicos, people are starting going, I haven't been since the pandemic. Um, but a lot of my friends have come back and they're fine. Uh, and then when things open up again, you know, it would be Europe because they have the infrastructure Cyprus I'm doing in June because it's a European country has the infrastructure and has low rates and is really strict at screening everyone, uh, who are only vaccinated, fully vaccinated before they get in. And then it's going to be places like, you know, East, A- um, East Asia, who have been like, been scarred from H1N1 and SARS, uh, so <laughs> yeah. like know how to, you know, control a pandemic, um, you know, especially, especially so soon. Lightning doesn't strike twice. Well, that's why I'm hope. I mean, I could be wrong uh, when it comes to East Asia and then Southern, Southeast Asia, um, if they get the infrastructure, I think would be, uh, if it gets back to pre-pandemic abilities to travel through. I think that's a really good place that's affordable and great for the young backpacker. And that was my first true backpacking um, trip after Egypt. It's been uh, very helpful with the vaccines. You can see uh, the rates and hospitalizations, ho- hospitalizations have been decreasing. I think I want to get into what it's like being on the front lines of you being an emergency physician in New York City. Uh, but first, I want to ask, what made you 
want to go into emergency medicine, especially like since you're like this worldwide traveler, you love the upkeep uh, lifestyle, you're always go, go, go. So I can see why you're more so drawn to emergency medicine. Also, while it's such a, it has like one of the highest burnout rates for physicians. So I think it's pretty impressive that you're still, you're still going and you still have that drive and motivation to keep pursuing this while also having a, your own kind of traveling empire. So what made you want to go into emergency medicine? So remember when I said in my uh, opening story that I never gave up on anything, I still bartended, I still traveled, and I still did my social justice work while as a full-time medical student, because that was part of the bet, that if I don't get it anywhere, I could check that box off and know I'm not meant to be a doctor, at least I tried, at least I know. And that didn't happen, so that would you know, keep doing it. I mean, I'm definitely grateful for the experience. I know people would kill to be my to be in my shoes to get into medical school. So I didn't want to give up on that opportunity. Uh, I definitely like cherished it and, you know, made it sacred of, uh, of an effort. But at the same time, I, you know, had to be genuine and authentic and honest with myself. That still wasn't sure. Grateful for the opportunity, but I, you know, felt like an imposter. I was told I was the imposter. And in that, I, the second part of it is like, if I were in the unlikely of scenarios to get into medical school, not give up on that opportunity, respect it, keep going with it, but not sacrifice all the other things that made me happy. I would still bartend, I would still do my social justice stuff, and I would still travel. And in that, because I kept it for all four years of, bar of medical school, uh, when it came to choosing a specialty, the closest thing to bartending I could think of was emergency medicine. <laughs> it's, it's my, it was my favorite job. No, well, now I'm going to be getting a different job. What's the closest thing to my favorite job that I knew of? Was it going to be working in a lab? No. I, I didn't I liked working in a lab, but it wasn't like my favorite. I love the people there, but it wasn't just like my lifestyle. Um, it didn't quite fit. I mean, and I'm glad I did it for seven years. I published, um, you know, it's, but it's just, you know, I didn't want to do that. So I, I wasn't into like that research stuff or being a pathologist where like I'll spend most of my time in lab. Um, these are just little clues. What, what was my favorite job? Bartending, sometimes promoting, but bartending. And think about what emergency medicine is like. You're behind a bar. Instead of alcohol or bottles, it's a bar of computers. No one's allowed to step behind that bar other than staff. You got to be prepared for whoever's going to come in. It's the same kind of patients and the clientele as the bar staff, as the, as the bar, uh, what the bar staff encounters. So the belligerent, the down and out, the depressed, the, the people with alcohol, people drink too much alcohol. <laughs> you have to be able to handle uh, that with a plume and you got to move as fast as possible. Uh, make people love you in the short amount of time you have with them before you move on to the next one. Uh, and hopefully they don't need you again because you made a really awesome drink. And if they did, you can circle back. It's the same thing. You can't, no one's allowed to step behind your bar. You can, you know, have to throw, you have to know when to cut people off and establish high boundaries, uh, customer service. And, you know, it's like, I guess the attending is like the bar manager uh, where they go around and say, Hey, how are you liking my bar? How are you liking my ER? Give this guy a talent on the house before he goes. Um, where, you know, it's, as a resident, you're the bartender. And this is the story I used for residency interviews where they were so fascinated by, you know, all my travels and my stories. They wanted to meet me no matter how bad my grades were. They just wanted to meet me as a person. And remember when people apply to things and just know the other side of that application is a human being with emotions. You want people to take you for you as a person. Uh, and it comes to emergency medicine, it, it came down to hiring who would I want to work with at three o'clock in the morning when, you know, shit is going down, when, 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 when things are about to fall apart in the ER, who do I want next to me? It's a human being, not someone who's the smartest or, you know, who read from every book, but someone who could connect with people and be able to manage things and read, you know, the patient behind the patient who can read the room and meet people where they are. Someone who's compassionate. Uh, and when someone's reading your application and they see somebody that does the same things that they do, emergency ER doctors, travel too. They, they do. They love those, the, those kind of things. They wanted to finally meet me. And I finally gave that story about like, this is why I wanted to be emergency medicine. It's the closest thing to bartending I could think of. <laughs> uh, the guy interviewing me, I remember was like, took some, took, takes off his glasses. And I was like, that was the best damn story. Uh, the best damn reason I've ever heard <laughs> to the question. Uh, you got the job. And it's really just, you know, being a part human being. I think the closest thing I can ex analogy is office space. Watch that movie if you haven't yet. The, the main character uh, gets hypnotized, but then stays in the hypnosis, stays by accident. Uh, and while everyone's trying to keep their jobs in their office when they're trying to like, you know, clean house or fire, you know, certain people, or, you know, 
the the main character actually in his hypnosis he just becomes as honest as possible and just says i i just fire me i don't i really don't work enough i i don't care for my job i hate my job and you know i i'm grossly overqualified i'm grossly overpaid for the amount of work that i do and he ends up getting promoted because of his honesty and truth even though he says all the wrong things and i and, and that movie comes from somewhere it comes from actual experiences of people who are writing that screenplay of those who have experienced what it means to do what is authentic thinking that you're gonna get rejected or fail out with good riddance because you it's their loss that's the attitude right if you're going to reject me for being my honest and true authentic self it's better off that we don't work together in the first place because god forbid i have to fake it in a way that i, I that i feel like i'm selling my soul for a job where then if i were to get accepted i still have to fake it for the next you know four or six years i'm with you i would just you know not know myself at the end of the road i'd rather stay true to myself get rejected eventually f finding out that the person that takes me for being me is the right fit and that way I don't waste anyone's time. Sure, I might endure more rejections, but that confidence in yourself actually practically may actually give you all the acceptances. You may think you're gonna get rejections, but you don't know unless you do it. And I think people make decisions based on emotions, not necessarily logic. Uh, we, we try to balance that out, equalize that with uh, the match system in medical school, but even then the people making the match are human beings. So when I got matched into emergency medicine in one of the top programs in New York, I think it was purely a human emotion decisions. And I'm that good, thank God, because I want to work for a program that takes me for me. Yeah, I think that's, this is a bit of a tangent, but we, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of listeners and, and wave deals primarily with high school students who are applying to colleges and that are kind of transitioning into that period of their life. And I think it's just so important to do what you did and truly represent yourself. You know, I, I, I think I've talked about this in the past, but me and my dad got into a little bit of an argument when I was writing my college papers because he wanted me to write my papers more like a resume than, um, than what I wanted to do, which was to, to tell my story and to try to show who I was, kind of what you were saying there. That yeah. if, you know, I didn't want a school to accept me for for any reason other than they wanted me at their school. They wanted my perspective. They wanted my voice to be amongst their student body. And so I think that that's so important when applying to, to truly represent yourself, to show what makes you an interesting person to talk to at a party instead of really, a, you know, an interesting essay to read, you know, for your professor. Um, yeah. I had that experience. My dad, wrote my essay as an as a resume or made me write the way he wanted me to write it. why you know i should be a scientist in medicine remember your parents have great intentions they love you but they not it may not be the love language that fits you you this is a point in your inflection point in your life your hero story where you have to then decide is this really coming from you or from your parents i mean i was lucky if you will but not really lucky because i don't ever want to wish on anyone when my dad died and my mom got sick. I'm not, I don't think that's lucky. I, I, I was one of the worst summers of my life, but I have to reframe it as the best summer of my life because it was the first time in my life I was free to think for myself truly. But I think that when my father was still alive, when applying to me, uh, in college, there were some colleges that he got away with it where he, I had to submit it. He was watching me, literally watching like a helicopter, uh, submit the essay that he wanted to. And there are many moments where I went to the post office on 34th and 11th um, the, in New York City switching out the essays, not submitting his essay, but submitting my essay, how I like organize a film screening for Better Luck Tomorrow, which is the first Asian American uh, Hollywood film featuring Asian Americans of non-stereotypical roles back in 2003 and how the, the like all the 600 people came, including those cast and crew and me as a 16 year old organizer and junior year of high school was able to do this. And what I learned about being a person of color, like that, my dad hated that. He hated that essay. He hated the fact that I, you know, wanted to write about movie screenings, uh, let alone Asian Americans. Too, too, too political, too controversial. You're stirring the pot. I submitted that essay, and that was, that's the essay. They got me into all the colleges that I got accepted into. Like literally, like if you want to experiment, it was a little placebo group. Everyone rejected me with my father's essay. <laughs> and an experimentation group with a sample size of like 40, 50 colleges I applied to, all the ones I submitted my own essay accepted me. 
literally 100% with a very great power, uh, with a large <laughs> enough sample size. I trust it. And I went, I ended up going to Columbia. And Columbia told me, it's like, we didn't care for your scores. We didn't care that you were president of every guy club. That kind of helped. But, you know, we really loved your essay that you were willing to take a chance. And when I applied to medical school, and just letting you know, I'm just, re, you know, this is a one on one here. Uh, I wrote a story. I wrote like as if I was describing a movie scene. It was very like it was very inspired by someone that advised me how to write a medical school application essay as a movie script, as like describing a story and in reflection with some prose, but then to go back to the scene to make the reader feel like they're there. So they really, truly connected to someone they have never met in person yet. And so many people invited me to an interview, despite my like 3.0 GPA in college or my 31 MCAT um, as an Asian American. They still, even though I made, made none of the cutoffs, they still wanted to meet me really badly in person because they lose nothing by inviting me to an interview. And once you get your foot in the door and you get that emotional connection, I mean, not everyone accepted me after the interview. There's like, I really want to take you, but your scores just don't quite fine. I don't want to go to school where it demands me to be a slave to numbers. I don't want to go to school that judges me by a number. I know that you really like me as an interviewer, but you can only do so much, but the whole overarching decision-making comes from a school that really cares more about numbers. Then it's better off that I don't go to that school in the first place. But if I were to go to school, it says, you know what? When I'm taking a chance on you, we believe in you. Even though we don't quite make the cutoffs, we will support you and you know and uh, and you know endorse you for your candidacy for medical school. Then that's a fit. And guess what? Now I, I apparently been told that their Twitter is you know a lot of it has to be like you know like retweeting my stuff and you know <laughs> we're proud of our alumni but i was like remember during medical school they're like uh we don't know about you like i think we took too much of a chance and there were many times where i was put on conditional and had to re um take a test um you know or else i would have failed the entire year and repeat the year i mean there were moments where you know the way i had a lot of close calls and it was like oh man what a uh, do we make you repeat the year i mean i was bought in half of the class in medical school but they still believed in me uh, and now looking back, it all makes sense. I, now they all know, or we all know that we were, you know, I hopefully uh, did not make anything that we regretted. Um, in the moment, Steve Jobs would say, it may never make any sense connecting the dots moving forward. But when you look back, it makes a, a total sense. So you just got to trust and commit to the present. Yeah, I really you, agree with that. Uh, I just got out the whole deciding on a college whole process. And I told Dan this story. I don't know if we shared it on the podcast before, but I am not, I'm not the greatest at the SATs. Like I had a class, they had to refund me my times. money. I t they refunded me my money because of I didn't like improve my score or whatever in this like prep AC, yeah. like SAT class. But it was test optional because of COVID. So I got away with it. And I was just- I got away with a lot of things too. I applied <laughs> to like- for schools because they were like, oh, you should apply to like some Ivy Leagues and stuff. But I didn't, I didn't have the scores to get in or I didn't have like all the AP classes to get in. And I told my family, I'm like, I don't really want to pay $75 for a rejection letter, uh, <laughs> but I would want to go to a school that really values me as a person. And so I applied and I got the scholarship. I applied to the scholarship two days before it was due. I applied and they were like, hey, we want to interview you. And so I was interviewed and in my interview, I started crying. I was like bawling my eyes out during this interview because they were talking about like what you're passionate about and like all your story leading up to this. So if you could imagine like an 18 year old girl applied to college on a scholarship crying and then be saying, I'm sorry, like I'm PMSing, but I think, you know, like, that was like, I ended up getting that scholarship and that's where I'm going. I got a full ride to this school, but I really tr showed my true self in it. Oh, thank Congratulations. You. The, only, the only thing I would recommend is never apologize. Do not apologize. <laughs> you apologize like three yeah. times for telling me that story. And I'm like, why are you apologizing? <laughs> Don't be you know, so that's the thing. The person that apologizes for being yourself and authentic self. And, yeah, that's, I'm working on it. And yeah. Don't let yeah, me tell you what really you do either, but like, if I may create an environment where it's okay to not apologize, just own it. It's you. It's what got you in. Yeah. You're surrounded by the, a world that, of people that will support you and endorse you. And you, you create your world. You create your community. Definitely. Um, Dan, do you have anything you want to add? 
um just generally yeah or do you want to transition a little bit into covid yeah i think it would be great to to talk about your experience on the front lines you make your way through medical school as you said they put you on probation multiple times you're you know you, once you find probation once. <laughs> only once it's all good um you Condition. make it through medical school you make it through residency um and and now you're you know an emergency medicine doctor in in new york city and a worldwide pandemic hits and new york gets slammed in in the initial months in the u.s and the u.s's handling of the pandemic is quite poor what what was that like being in those first few months when people weren't quite sure what was going on, New York was on lockdown because, you know, the, the, the hotspot was blowing up so much. What was it like being in the emergency room um, during that insane time? I've seen enough things that give you nightmares for the rest of your life. (laughs) It's unforgiving. I, I don't I really don't know how to describe something unless you can just truly be there. I mean, we use the war analogy and I don't want to glorify war, uh, but the only problem was the only way to get to get people to pay attention was to equate it to war. Unfortunately, this country spends most of its money on <laughs> preparing for war, the defense budget, you know, and so the only way we can get their attention of like we're going to die was to equate our experiences to being in a war where you don't know when going in, if you'll make it out and unfortunate and unlike war. And I don't want to minimize a veteran's experience, but when you get shot, you go home that day, you know, you know, for sure. You just having to survive the bullet. uh, You are going home. You're not going to fight wounded. um, Once we get you out of that battle, but with COVID you go in, it's, you don't know if you're going to get shot. (laughs) You might have gotten shot, but you have to wait 21 days killing, you know, spreading it to other people in those 21 days, not really know for sure before symptoms come out as an asymptomatic carrier, before it's your turn to get sick. And then you get, you can't work anymore, but you have to wait 21 days. So imagine waking up every day, you know, wondering if you've been shot every morning before a shift and then going in, not knowing you're wounded or spreading it to other people and getting them hurt. uh, Just having that guilt. So without having enough PPE is another thing where at least in war, we supply our soldiers with the protective equipment, uh, helmets and, you know, bulletproof Kevlar, uh, gloves, boots, uh, you know, the the proper, the appropriate weaponry with us, we were given plastic bags and N95s. They took 20 minutes to find, and then being told by the CDC to wear scarves and bandanas if we couldn't find N95s or to recycle our N95s, something that was supposed to be used for single use per patient, but to hold it on for up to like two to three weeks. Uh, that's PTSD. And we were like literally running naked into a category five hurricane and having the country goes, yep, that's the normal thing. And then on top of that, knowing that our job security was not insured because they were telling everyone to cancel elective surgeries. And that's actually where the bulk of the money will, will come from for hospitals. So even in places in the country where the, the pandemic hasn't had yet to arrive in, they were laying off frontline healthcare workers that they couldn't afford them. And they were understaffing in an already understaffed ER or hospital, uh, even uh, right in preparation for a pandemic, which is ironic. <laughs> and even to this day, it's been a whole year, no matter how uh, out there that I am in the media or in my, 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 on social media about COVID I have been, I still have yet to lay eyes or even touch a, pers- a, a positive air purifying respirator, a PAPR, the, the astronaut suit that should be standard of care when sending frontline healthcare workers to combat an invisible new pandemic and virus that we don't know anything about back in March and April. It's been a whole year and three months and I still haven't seen one of those. And that is actually standard care. Everyone says, oh, what about the N95s that you have and the PPE? That's like arguing that, oh, where's the chain mail when we're supposed to be fighting 21st century warfare? <laughs> so the way I could pre- to explain that on my social media back in March and April was how a lot of people somehow like got it because it's a language, the love language, unfortunately, that this country responds to because, you know, it's a country there. Most of the money comes from defense, depending on and, and warfare and you can, and, and economy too. You cannot run an economy on uh, without a healthcare system. 
So all that was just going to my head before I went into work every day. Uh, as a per diem doctor, so I, after residency, I decided to go fully per diem and locums and now just per diem because it skips the middleman of locums. And what that means is that I credential myself at many, 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 many hospitals in a city or a region. I get IDs everywhere. I can work anywhere and I can choose when to work and where to work whenever I want and wherever I want. Uh, I have leverage in that I don't have to work overnight shifts if I'm working a day, month full of day shifts. You know, I can tell another hospital, sorry, I can't come. Or just say I'm burnt out. I want to travel and tell all the hospitals. I don't have to tell you why. I just I just can't work today because I don't feel like it. And maybe in one day when there's a pandemic, I can choose to sit it all out because I don't want to bring it home to my mom or grandfather or grandmother, um, you know, if I visit them. Uh, and ironically, what actually happened was I went in literally every day, I think, or like almost every day where I like worked 35 shifts in the first 40 to 50, yeah, 45, 50 days. I was back, so I only had 15 days off in the first 50 days. Now, to give you an idea, what's full-time works about 10 to 12 shifts a month in an ER. And I worked 35 shifts in the first month then and a half, uh, three months worth. Uh, so uh, I was overworking in over nearly a dozen emergency rooms. Uh, and I don't know why I did it. I just felt like I had to. I needed to see what was going on in other emergency rooms. I wanted to know what was going on. And I think that actually allowed me to prevent burnout, to answer your earlier question. Uh, because I've traveled so much, before, because I made it a habit to always being comfortable with what makes me uncomfortable, because I made it a habit to always run towards the fire, because I had traveled to 190 countries and territories, so 150 UN recognized countries, uh, in the last eight, eight uh, nine years, um, I can now rely on a habit that's like as if you went to the gym every day since you were born, you know, not born, uh, since, you know, you were an adolescent, that you will now be able to recharge much more quickly. Um, and to have that variety of experiences allowed me in a way that full-time doctors could not, a perspective that full-time doctor, full doctors could not have. If you're full-time, you sign up with one, one hospital and you work at that one hospital for the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and you don't know in that silo what's going to other hospitals. So when you run out of PPE at one hospital, you're like, man, my hospital sucks. Oh my God, I wish I picked the other job. But you don't know what you don't know. You may hear that other hospitals may also run out of PPE, but unless you work there, you you think in your silo in this in this echo chamber that you had it you you had it bad. You had the bad deck of cards. If only you knew, you know, down the road that there was a better ER. But then I was able to work in many ERs and realize it was going around everywhere. And it was a problem everywhere that I knew was not me. It wasn't that I made the wrong decision or chose the wrong hospital. Or, or you know, it, it was just the fact that this was a, a global national problem. But I was not only did I know it, I was actually experiencing it. So I appreciated it better coming back, um, just knowing that it was nothing that I did wrong and I was still, uh, and I, I could only do my best. And not only that, I, being able to choose when and where to work gave me that autonomy. And I think that was so much better for me than to be scheduled to go into work in the middle of a pandemic. When sometimes you just need time to recharge. Um, those 35 days I worked, I am happy in all of that I worked all of them. The 15 days I had off in the first 15 days, I scheduled that to make sure I didn't burn out or you know was pouring from an empty cup. So all of that I think is unique to my experience because most, if not, I think every other doctor I've met except for one other person uh, is full-time. So don't take it that uh, what I experience is emblematic of every other doctor in New York City. This is only my experience. It's very inspiring to hear how far you've came and how you are still pursuing medicine. And I find it really interesting how you do have that autonomy and you do still get to travel and have a life outside of your job while not burning out. I think, you know, travel for you is like free therapy and that's how you keep going. And yeah, it's a balance. Yeah. yeah. And I actually... Like love being a doctor. I mean, I, you don't really know it. Until, it's like, yeah, it's kind of like relationships. You don't know until like two years in or three years in, you're like, well, I love this person. I mean, you may have an idea starting out, but you know, until you experience it. And it wasn't until like as my third year residency. And then after COVID, I was like, I really love, I'm going in all the time because I actually love it. I mean, what is love, but a temporary form of insanity. <laughs> when you're doing something, even though it's logically could be bad for you. I don't need to work 35 shifts in the first 50 days. I need, I can work just my normal 10 to 11 and still say I was full time. No, I went in even when my, especially when my colleagues got sick, I covered for them. You know, when I, if I had the day off, I would cover, I would go in. They would ask me literally last minute to come in because if I didn't come in, there would be no ER to run. And I just knew that if I didn't go in, 
that year could be one step closer to collapsing because you need a doctor uh, and a nurse to run an ER. And, you know, if we didn't show up, then the ER can't function and the patients will have to go somewhere else. And that will cause a domino effect to cause other ER systems to collapse, especially when they were running out of money and PPE. And then without a you know, hospital system in New York City, that will, you know, I just to see that writing on the wall. So I had to go in, uh, but I wanted to because it came from me. And I think that, that I'm grateful to that. And, uh, and this story is really for the people who are not sure. It doesn't matter if you're not sure, just do it. And the things that, that truly love you will support you in whatever you do, and especially the things that you do. Uh, and it'll get you to where you need to be. I think, you know, the challenges that have been presented both to individuals and to countries during the last year have been both extreme and varied, you know, um, where you were talking about earlier, the PPE shortages and the laying off of, you know, frontline workers when when a pandemic was hitting, you know, all of these early stresses and all of these early traumatic experiences um, earlier on in the pandemic. And then nowadays, you know, PPE is maybe less of an issue, but now we're struggling with getting everybody vaccinated and not just everybody in the country vaccinated, but everybody worldwide vaccinated and trying to, to reform to, I mean, trying to return to some form of, normalcy. Um, and at first it was, it was pretty encouraging seeing, you know, the immense demand that we had for the vaccine. It, you know, it, it's not great that we were struggling to get, you know, needles into people's arms, but at least it, it's a better problem to have more people lining up for the vaccine and not quite having enough than to have too many vaccines just sitting around and nobody who wants to take them. Um, in my mind, at least for, for returning for that end goal of returning to normalcy. Um, and now we're seeing vaccine rates starting to drop in the U S and worldwide. Um, and, and, and in my view, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not an emergency medicine doctor in New York city. I'm some random kid in his basement in Utah, but that this seems to be the next big challenge for our country in terms of this pandemic is getting um getting everybody vaccinated and when so many people are hesitant or even militantly against getting vaccinated um this this is a a massive issue what do we in your view what do we need to do both individually and as a country to get more people um kind of comfortable and desirous to receive the vaccine so that we can put this pandemic to some point, you know, at some point somewhat behind us. Obviously, coronavirus will probably continue to be around um, in the coming years, but to where we can return to a more normal um, lifestyle. I mean, first of all, I don't want normal. I don't want to return to normal. <laughs> yeah. Fuck yeah. normal. Normal is what got us here in the first place. <laughs> yeah, normal yeah. is what got us here in the first place. If we return to normal, you're going to have another pandemic by next year and not earlier. It's just, it's, it's, I don't, I don't, you know, I want to be better. Yeah. And better is way, is definitely not normal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, we repeat mistakes and history rhymes. And I, I really want to live in a world where we don't actually have to worry about getting PPE for frontline healthcare workers or be in a position where we have to deal with a pandemic that's laying off frontline healthcare workers before a pandemic comes to our shores, let alone, you know, having an issue in believing in the pandemic. Now, finally, people are believing it um, <laughs> and it's, they, they don't want to wear masks and then all everyone's wearing masks. And I was like, oh, I don't want to believe in vaccines. It's, it's the understanding and empathy uh, for people who, um, if they if they deserve your time and these are i'm talking about family members people you love they may be afraid try to understand why they don't want to get vaccinated obviously my mantra is like we oh, can only help the people that want to be helped you can't force it on them if you tell them it's kind of really like the relationships you tell your partner even someone you love what to do they can't do this they should do that they will probably do it and you might get a short-term gain but in the long-term gain they start developing resentment for you and start planning their exit strategy. In this case, as a pandemic, they start planning anti-vasc rallies. They start planning like vaccine burning, you know, 
or whatever, you know, just, just not believe, spreading misinformation as like a, a reaction. And we talked about positive reactions. Med school was stressful. So therefore, I decided to do an extreme response to that stress by extremely traveling uh, to balance that out. I mean, we're all creatures of that, that respond. Uh, we have an emotional uh, reset um, in, that's built into us. So when we see so much death, people, even people who don't believe in the, in the pandemic, will start to put on a mask. I've seen that happen. Well, they'll logically say, you know, it, in, in one thing and emotionally act another way. Um, and when it comes to forcing people to vaccinate, I think is ideal for a short term game. I'm all for that. But without, if I'm not thinking about it, but if I truly think about it, what are the, the consequences when you force people against their will? And I worry that it's this like they're going to pick one person that's going to have a heart attack, right? Because people still have heart attacks before vaccines and they're <laughs> going to use that as a poster child and be like, oh, I was right uh, and spread misinformation and be the hero of their and get their 15 minutes of fame. And I, and I think these people are more likely to do that if they're afraid. And when you're in a pandemic in a lockdown against an invisible enemy where tanks are not rolling down the street uh, against a foreign enemy tanks rolling down your street and you're locking down because of this invisible enemy, you don't see why, but you have to do it. And you're hearing about other people dying, but you don't quite see it because you're not in the emergency rooms like I am. Then you become afraid. And in that fear, in your silo, without any other feedback other than your social media, um, you start latching on to whatever is, is, is matching with your confirmation bias. I kind of believe in this doesn't make sense. And then you feel to see something else that kind of like validates that no matter how far fetched it is, you're going to hold on to that. And then you're going to start reposting that in a declaration from that fear of your desire to mean something in a lockdown, um, to finally like affirm your existing individuality, no matter how wrong you are, the fact that other people like your posts and reshare your posts, no matter how, uh, inaccurate it is, you are starting to get those endorphin hits of being liked or being reposted. And then you start getting into it like a drug. You become addicted to that endorphin rush of reposting misinformation uh, so that you you are declaring your individuality as a response to that fear that you may develop when you're in a pandemic. Now, if you approach people, and these are the people who are worth it, your loved ones who may not believe in the vaccine, with empathy and understanding and validate that fear, and try to take the power away from spreading misinformation on them, and just making them realize like it's so much more powerful instead of to fight fear with anger, but to fight fear with love and to see that how vaccinating yourself is not really protecting yourself, but more so your entire community is the same thing as realizing that taking care of yourself is not ignoring other people. Taking yourself can actually include investing in other people in your community so that they will take care of you when it's your, your turn to fall down. People don't really extrapolate that they think oh you know they self-care self-love got to take care of myself means ignoring everyone else uh and focusing on myself which sure in the immediate sense of feeding yourself sure but when it comes to like health and being part of a community and a social contract it's actually to take care of other people to help others is as long as you have it in your bandwidth because that's actually an investment in yourself um, we can even go into like uh, uh, analogy of the Holocaust with the, the poem where like, I didn't speak up for this community when they took them. I didn't speak up for this community when they took them. I didn't speak for this community too, because I need to take care of myself and take care of myself. But then when they finally came to me, uh, came for me, nobody spoke up for me and they took me away. So that's the idea that it's actually taking care of yourself when you take care of others. And that's the whole basis of being vaccinated. When you're vaccinated, you're less likely to get sick, transmit it and overwhelm the hospital system so that when your neighbor gets into a car accident, they're not, they don't have to wait 10 hours to see a doctor because so many other people who didn't get vaccinated are crowding the emergency room because they got, became a hotspot with COVID symptoms that are really bad enough that requires hospitalizations. And your neighbor then dies because they waited too long to see a doctor because the ERs are overcrowded and understaffed because so many people in that community didn't get vaccinated. And then when it's your turn to get sick, the doctors are all sick because they have just been overwhelmed, they burnt out, and you now have to drive 100 miles to the nearest hospital for this heart attack instead of five miles from the hospital. They just shut down because, you know, they've been overwhelmed. That's what a p power of a vaccine is, is that you, you're you not just protecting yourself, but you're protecting everyone else. You No one is safe until all of us are safe. So that is the whole idea of herd immunity, too. Like, oh, if everyone else, I could be the one of the 10% not vaccinated, have my cake and eat it, too, and the pandemic was over. Well, what if you end up catching COVID? You could possibly be that person that mutates that virus one last time to be resistant to all the vaccines because you weren't vaccinated. And we'll just restart 2020 all over again. And that's on you. You're, the death of your grandma, the death of your mother, the death of your father, because you chose not to get vaccinated. 
your death of your child, the future children, your partner, your loved one, because you decided not to get vaccinated because you mutated this virus by getting sick. Uh, that's on you. And I will never tell you what to do. I will never tell you how to feel. I, I feel like if I, it goes back to what I said, if I do so, I feel like you might resent me and actually lead an anti-mass rally in response. And I don't want that. I really want it to come from you truly, authentically. I don't want you to be forced to. Um, obviously, I'm not in a position of public policy or politics to, you know, have the privileges, you know, saying that, oh, you do you. Um, sometimes you have to do things like lockdowns and whatever in, in a position of power. But for me right now, as a, as a private citizen, you're asking me, in my privilege, in my space, I know what I know is I will not force you what to do, but I'm just going to let you know the consequences if you decide not to do that. You will get people like me sick. You will overwhelm doctors like me. Hospital systems might collapse. And you're, if that doesn't matter to you, then at least think about your loved ones that you might kill by not getting vaccinated. And if you're okay with that, then cool. Well, I mean, I just know that I don't, I don't want to hang out with you. I don't ever want to see you. I don't want to associate with you because I can create my own, you know, my own community. You're just not part of it. I, at least you're upfront about it. And I know for, you know, you're saving me time. I'll just cut you out of my life. Uh, just don't be surprised if I do so because I have the, uh, the, the freedom to do so as well. But in knowing you're a person that will not vaccinate to protect your own family members and vulnerable, immunocompromised future children, partner, family member, or friend. I don't want, you're not my right to die, homie. And therefore I will cast you out of my community um, because you, you have plenty of other friends you can hang out with. But if that's what you want to do, then that's on you. And for those who are hesitant to get the vaccine because of efficacy, and there are many trials that, uh, many trials you can see online, the whole vaccine process is not uh, ineffective. It is all accurate. It's just, it was accelerated. They did all the steps to create the vaccine at the same time. So nothing was skipped. It is safe. You can go online to the CDC or the NHA and see the facts and see the trials and everything that happened. And no matter what vaccine, if it's the Johnson & Johnson, if it's Pfizer or if it's Moderna or if it's any other vaccines, please go get vaccinated. There are tons of options for oh, that. We're talking about the COVID vaccine. I'm just talking about all vaccines. You want to talk about the COVID vaccine, vaccine. Yeah. generally? But it's, yeah, it's been, it, vaccines. the COVID vaccine's been around for 40 years. Did you know that? This shit's been around since 1970. Like it's one. Of, it's a pretty old technology. It's like when COVID came around and they decided to create a COVID vaccine. It's like, hey, you got the blueprint for making a chair? It's like, yeah, we've been making chairs since the 1700s, 1600s. Okay, well, can you paint it red? I don't know. Painting a red, like a red chair? Uh, yeah, can you do that in seven months and do trials where you have like 50,000 patients sit on that red chair to see if it's, it's legit? Uh, yeah, we could do that like in a couple hours. Yeah, but you got seven months. That's the MRI vaccine for COVID. The MRI vaccine has been around since 1970. The technology has been just chilling there. It's like electric cars. We've had like electric cars since the 1970. And... We just didn't never needed a use for them because people love their gasoline powered cars until Tesla made it cool. And you, you're really just saying if you're if you're hesitant about this COVID nineteen vaccine, it's like saying like I don't know Teslas, um, I, I they, they might blow up. I I, I I don't know how I feel about electric cars. Isn't it kind of too new? I'm okay. I was like, all right, then you you shoot a Tesla in in the engine, you're shooting the trunk. <laughs> you shoot a, a, a gasoline powered automobile like car. It's going to blow up. It's it's the same thing with MRI vaccine. It's safer. It's better tech. It's newer in, in a way that it's it wasn't invented in 1920. It was invented in 1970. And what we did by making it COVID specific is as if we told a chair company to paint a chair red or a car company to make it a convertible instead of one with a, a roof. It's very easy. Uh, and I mean, if anything, it's much safer than all the vaccines you got when you were growing up. All the stuff you ate in your second grade high school, caf uh, second grade elementary school cafeteria. It doesn't yeah. change the engine of your car. It just it's, puts in a different fuel. It goes around. It's, better, it's just better, <laughs> cleaner tech. It's it's safer than a dead virus. It's because it's it's just a message that tells your body. It's like, oh, okay, I can do this. Um, if anything, I've gotten stronger. My sleep has been better. <laughs> this is a placebo effect. But yeah, no, I mean, my life has been <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for sure. It it's like, um, you know, when we rolled out the polio vaccine, like for you know forever ago, you know that that was a rapid rollout with much much less testing than this vaccine went through, and it was incredibly successful. Um, smallpox. 
Yeah, they literally injected the actual smallpox virus into you as a variolation. You know, Native Americans have been doing it since forever. Uh, the Chinese yeah. have been doing it forever. Uh, and yet people are still nervous about it's like same thing like the Tesla and the automobile. I don't know. Would you not would you think the Tesla's less safe than a gasoline car car if you were being shot at? Being shot at <laughs> would be COVID, right? Being shot at is like this idea of a pandemic around that can always threaten you. So if you're driving a car through a war zone, would you rather drive an electric car or a gasoline like <laughs> what a driving bomb? Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it, you would just have to make that connection. Um, and I also like the, the logic, like, oh, I heard one person got, you know, this from the vaccine in a negative way, uh, is the same logic as if you could say, well, I heard somebody was able to do one on pushups. that will be me, by the way, uh, right after getting the vaccine. Of course, I probably could do one on pushups before getting the vaccine, but I never thought about doing it until after I got the shot as a joke. And I somehow was able to do 35 one on pushups. I can literally say that I never did one on pushups until I got the vaccine because I never tried. <laughs> so now you can, that's the same logic as why well, I heard somebody got sick after getting the vaccine in a bad way. And, you know, I'm kind of scared now. You literally, that's the same logic. You know, it's like, well, if you're going to use that same emotion, the same logic. I have to equally say I heard somebody got, got it and became a super soldier and now like is living the dream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it just equalizes and you just have to, you know, or just trust neither and do your own research and realize that there have been millions of people who got vaccinated way before you and are doing just fine. But however, millions of people got COVID and are no longer with us. Yeah. If COVID was in West Africa, uh, like Ebola uh, or H1N1 SARS um, in Asia, Right. And there was a vaccine available to us. I mean, I would take it as a frontline health worker because I could be exposed in a minute. But to a normal community member, it's like the rabies vaccine. I'm like, unless you're going to become a veterinarian, you know, or travel to a place that you're going to deal with livestock, hold off on the rabies vaccine. You might not need it because it, we're going to monitor it. And, you know, until Ebola comes over uh, or COVID comes over, uh, you know, hold off. I don't get the yellow fever vaccine unless I'm traveling to a place with yellow fever. Uh, so that's the, how I feel about it. Like, you know, don't get it all at once um but we don't have that privilege because covid is everywhere yep <laughs> and it's very strong here so in the why u.s not get the rabies vaccine or gardasil or you know if, if if you know being rabies if you are going to a zoo and, and working in a zoo gardasil when you be you know we're going to have partners who have hpv like you know you get it as a as a risk reduction and that's the same with COVID. COVID is now here. That's why yeah. you make that decision to do it. So we're starting to run out of time a little bit. I wanted to ask you one more question. Sure. You know, we talked slightly um, earlier on about how you don't want us to return to normal, per se. You want us to um, to make some alterations, to, to have a better future than what our past was. What do you see specifically as things that either you hope that we will change moving forward or that you think will definitely change moving forward to help prevent, you know, a massive global pandemic from killing millions of people again? I mean, we circling back to the beginning of this uh, podcast episode is that I talked about how I was just a zombie being told what to do and not knowing what was good and what wasn't. I mean, this is Plato's allegory of the cave. Like I was just thinking this was normal and, you know, being told what to do, being, you know, being forced to be a doctor or playing piano every day or taking the SAT three times. Um, and I didn't know about any better until something really bad happened to me, something traumatic. I lost my father after an argument with him. He, he went on a treadmill to blow off some steam and had a heart attack and died. My mom taking antidepressants because I guess, you know, living in that kind of family with, you know, a, you know, a father that was very emotionally like helicoptery, uh, you know, myself being me, um, <laughs> developed Parkinson's and, you know, and losing my, you know, my partner at the time, she, you know, right after the funeral, she, um, had her needs and, you know, I had to validate that too, because she's a human being with who make a decision for herself. I'm not mad at her, but like I lost everything. And then what I realized is like, it's not why me, why me, why me, but why not me? What makes me so special that summer that those things wouldn't happen to me? It can happen to anyone. And that's when I realized instead of just trying to run away from these problems, just accept that trauma is always going to happen to all of us because the universe is so chaotic and random. 
And because of that, in that chaos, instead of what the least we can do, instead of running away from it, is to run towards it, to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, to instead embrace it, to treat it as a friend, to greet it as a friend, to run towards the fire, because we at least have that ability. Uh, no matter how chaos the chaos the universe is, we still have the control to decide what to do. A feeling is just a feeling. It's the meaning and action assigned to the feeling that makes it uh, a difference. And then we go then to COVID or medical school, fear. Yeah, fear of COVID, fear of an invisible enemy, fear of going back to medical school, fear of traveling while I was a full-time medical student. That fear could have led me to the action of, I won't do it then. I won't go in. I won't travel. I'll study really hard. I'll do. I'll go by the books. I'll do what's normal. Or fear is the motivating fuel for me to be like, you know what? This is the thing that I'm now going to use it to make me go in and do what I feel is courageous. And what I mean by create the word courage, if it, there was no fear preceding the courage, you wouldn't call it courageous. It'll just be easy, <laughs> right? Like, you know, skydiving. Wow, you must be so brave. Well, if skydiving was as easy as like walking across the street without any cars, and we all thought skydiving as that way, then you wouldn't call skydiving brave. You wouldn't call walking across the street without cars brave, right? But because we assign the idea to something as something that inspires fear, skydiving, going to work when there's a pandemic, going to, traveling while I was a full-time medical student, applying to medical school, um, we still skydive. We still travel. We still do these things in response to that fear because we know that that's what courage derives from. And I, and therefore I did these things because of fear. I won't let fear control me. I can use it to inspire me. It's reframing something negative. So now to answer your question about what I hope from the future is that this year, this pandemic, instead of being the reason that holds us back to make us afraid to create, generate more anxiety, which is going to happen to accept that it does has done all those things. It will do those things as if it was a generational trauma, collective trauma that we all experienced together. Just like, you know, as if, you know, what I went through when my dad died, um, that all of us went through this together to, instead of letting it control us to reframe it and make it right. The worst summer of my life into the best summer of my life. Obviously I'm not going to call COVID the best year of my life. It was pretty <laughs> shitty, uh, but I'm not going to let it control me. I'm, I'm going to reframe it as a, an opportunity for growth to take it as the motivating fuel to get me to travel even more to knowing that if I don't do it now, there could be another pandemic around the corner that if I don't live now and do the things that I want to do now without hurting other people, I'm not saying like, you got to be entitled to like do spring break in a place that can't handle the, <laughs> no, that's, that's really rude. And don't be, don't be that person. Um, but to do things responsibly, ethically and having your cake and eating it too, do it now. Because if you get into the psychology postponement, oh, now that we survived the pandemic and this trauma, let me just recharge uh, and put off traveling, all the stressful stuff until like four years later when I like feel more comfortable, which, yeah, you do you, but be careful of that because that becomes a habit. Once you start going to that in response as a fearful response mechanism to uh, that generation trauma, like I'm kind of scared and ask yourself, is it really coming from you or is it coming from being socialized to doing something that is supposed to make you safe? Then you're just postponing things. Then it becomes easier than once that four year that turnaround happens. You get to travel again. It's so much easier to say, you know, I'll, I'll travel after I get married. Maybe I'll save it for the honeymoon. But then you have kids, and it's like I'll travel after my kids grow up, and then it's too late. And then the and by the time he's ready to travel again, a pandemic hits again. Another <laughs> pandemic hits again. You know, so you got to be careful there of you know make the decision point that has to be made when we start reopening up again. Uh, and what we just experienced to acknowledge it, to greet it as a friend, to validate it, to not suppress or repress it or ignore it and take that and use it as an energy fuel for something positive instead of something negative. I could have ended a downward spiral, drop out of college and not, you know, done anything after my dad died and be a perfectly good excuse for me to recharge myself. And, you know, but I wouldn't be here right now. God knows where I would be. I wouldn't be definitely not doing this podcast. I wouldn't be a doctor. Maybe I'll do something amazing. I don't know, but I definitely try to use it for something positive. And if I reframe that summer as the worst and best of my life, because that's my choice, I choose to worship that. So with all of us listening, on, all of you listening about this past year, you get to choose what to believe in. And if you choose to take this tragedy, this tr generational trauma they experience, and to do something negative or to go into a negative space, I caution you. You also have in the power to 
also reframe it and put it into a positive space. That it may be the inspiration and feel to be a better person and to build a better world. And I want you to be part of that if you can. You get to write your own story and take that bet and go travel or go do whatever you you want to pursue. So I don't. Are think- you doing video by any chance? What? I don't, know. I don't know. if People can see this, but yeah, is going to what you were saying. Yeah, you get. If I didn't lose that bet, and I decided to like study really hard, and you know, just buckle my buckle down, and you know, I probably still would have been a doctor. I probably would actually be on this podcast. I don't get a medical school. Well, you have to study really hard and be focused, <laughs> and I probably would have been like that. But like, I don't know if people can see this, but I'm doing two lines, two fingers right now, one on the bottom left and one on the top right. My story would have looked like this, a very linear line. And you would have not been able to ask me about my travel stories or my bartending analogy or, you know, all the colorful like things that I'm so grateful uh, to be able to explain to you and share with you. Um, it, it, we just wouldn't be able to talk about that. And that's not the story I want, this straight line. What I was able to give to you was losing a bet, taking a detour, going all over the place, almost, you know, being conditional uh, almost failing and getting back in and then doing the residency and then almost doing this and then traveling and then realizing I love being a doctor after the fact instead of before the fact <laughs> of a pl- application, being grateful that, thank God I chose the right thing, but then what is the right thing? And all of a sudden I'm here. I have so much to share. It, it goes beyond an hour of a podcast episode and I still became a doctor. I'm still the, the bottom left and top right fingers are still in the same points. I still am a doctor, you know, but now I'm a doctor with all these stories. I'm not my dad's doctor. I'm not Asian America's perfect doctor. I'm myself. It's my story. It's not about what you become. It's how you do it. Exactly. And that, that message is so inspirational. And I'm so happy that we were able to have you on today, um, that we were able to talk to you, talk through your crazy stories. Um, we could We could go on for several more hours. We wrote so many questions that we're... We're not going to get yeah, to we're gonna do a sequel. And a yeah, we'll, yeah, maybe maybe we'll just bring you on as a, as a host of the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, but it, it's been so amazing having you here with us today, Calvin. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on and and giving up so much of your time to to chat with us today and to share your stories with everybody. Um, be sure if to anyone listening, be sure to go check out the Monsoon Diaries. They're Super cool. If you want to travel, they have all their trips out on their website that are that are upcoming. Go take a look at them. You know, he, he mentioned the Cyprus trip. I was kind of looking into that very briefly when I was I, w- I was very tempted. <laughs> Every class uh, minute, another chance to turn it all around. Exactly. Thinking, people. Um. So yeah, go go check out the Monsoon Diaries for sure. Um, Wave is also hosting a um a summer camp this summer. You can go sign up for that on on our website. It's going to be super fun. Go check that out. Um, otherwise, thank you again, Doctor Doctor Sun. I've I've said this multiple times now. I've I've thanked you multiple times, but thank you so much. And um, to all the listeners, we will see you guys all next week. <laughs>